would like to do is um, just have a little word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into your presence, Father. And we just thank you, Father. We just thank you for the ability to do that, Lord. And it's through Jesus that you made that possible for us, Father. I ask you to bless this lesson, Father. Help me, Father. Give me the right words, Lord. And I just ask you to bless everyone here. Bless everyone on Zoom, Father. Just touch them, Father. Meet their needs in any way possible, Father, that whatever they need, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, for some unknown reason, I'm not sure exactly why, I'm nervous today. Sometimes I get really nervous and sometimes I don't get all that shook up. But anyway, our lesson today is praise for salvation. It comes from Acts 2, 32 and 33, and also 37 through 47. The resources that I used in this lesson include the New Schofield Study Bible, the Teacher's Manual, the Wycliffe Bible Commentary, and Hebrew Roots Holy Days First Fruits at David Schrock, S-C-H-R-O-C-K dot com. All right, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts both were written by a Gentile. That Luke, he wrote those two uh, books, and he was a physician. The Gospel of Luke is like part one, and Acts is part two. And he addressed both of these books to a certain Greek name, Theophilus. He wanted Theophilus to know the real truth. He wanted him to know. All right, um, Acts 1.8 anticipates the spread of the gospel message from Jerusalem to Samaria and on to the uttermost parts of the earth. The contents of Acts span about 30 years, beginning in A.D. 30. The time frame of our lesson is 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Acts 2.14 informs us that the Apostle Peter is the one speaking in today's text. There's a very good chance that many or most of his audience had been in Jerusalem and had seen Jesus' trials, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. It was natural for those making the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem for observance of Passover to also observe the festival of unleavened bread and the religious offering of first fruits to stay for the festival of weeks. And that came later, and that was about 50, it was 50 days after Pentecost, and it is known as, um, no, it's 50 days after Passover, and it's known as Pentecost. All right, you will recall that Pentecost was when the uh, Holy Spirit came as a mighty rushing wind, and he sat on the apostles' head and there was cloven fire coming out, and there was just a wonderful outpouring of this Holy Spirit, and the people that were listening heard the messages in their own language, and the Bible gives a whole list of countries that these people were from, and I will spare you that information. All right, most of Jesus' audience, however, was Jewish. Acts 2.5 states, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. And so these men would know the Torah. They would know the Jewish religion. They didn't need to be schooled in that because they were very knowledgeable, probably had been instructed from the cradle up. All right, the Feast of Unleavened Bread took place the day after Passover, and it lasted for seven days. And it was similar to Passover in that it was a commemoration of the Jews' exit from Egypt. And so they were to eat unleavened bread. And so the day before Passover, they cleaned their house of all yeast. They removed all of that leaven, and that represents sin. So they were trying to get rid of, symbolically getting rid of sin. As the Sabbath during the first day of unleavened bread ended, the temple priest went out into the barley field. Now, barley was the first grain that was matured in Israel. 
And so they went out to the barley field and they marked, uh, or the Sanhedrins marked an area for the priest. And the priest went and they cut a sheaf of barley. And they brought it back to the temple and they ground it and they made barley flour. And from that barley flour, they made a loaf. And they offered both, they waved the sheaf and they also waved the loaf in front of the uh, Holy of Holies so that the, uh, this was a sacrifice to Yahweh. All right, each family also brought a sheaf from their field, and this was known as first fruits. Okay, the first fruit was the day after, or it was this lifting up of the wave sheaf. That is considered first fruit. The latter fruit, the latter first fruit happens on the 50th day, so that is Pentecost. So really and truly, we are part of that latter day first fruit. Everybody that gets saved from the time that Jesus died on the cross until now, or until he comes back, is part of that latter first fruit. Okay, the intervening 50 days between the two first fruit occasions were to be counted day by day, traditionally called the counting of Omer. The barley was ready to harvest, so they waved their sacrifice at the temple and began the harvest right after the first day of the Sabbath rest. All right, <clears throat> we need to just spend a minute, and y'all need to excuse me one second. I'm not sick, I promise. At least I don't think I am. Okay. The festival of first fruits occurred on the third day of Passover. Now, what happened on Passover? Jesus was crucified. Okay, the festival of first fruits occurred on the third day of Passover and celebrated the first harvest of the season. It was a day of thanksgiving to God for the abundance of his provision. Likewise, it was a day of expectation for the greater harvest to come. All right, now, <clears throat> I got this from that Jewish website, which I told you about a minute ago. Messiah the first fruit. It was on the third day, the 17th of Nisan, which was the month, after his death, that the empty tomb of Jesus was discovered. As Passover lambs were being slain in the temple on the 14th of Nisan, Jesus himself was sacrificed. The wave sheet that was cut outside of Jerusalem on the 15th of Nisan, just before the 16th, the day of first fruits. Israel's priests were in the temple waving the first fruit offering of the barley harvest. That was, they offered that in front of the torn veil. And you remember when Jesus was crucified that the veil was rent in two. So here these priests are offering all of this in front of a torn veil, which is really ludicrous if you ask me, but nobody's asking me, but anyway, that's what I think. All right, so what is important here? The Messiah rose from the dead on the 17th of Nisan, exactly three days and nights on the third day, 72 hours after his death and burial. The Messiah rose and reported his resurrection to the priest at the temple on the first day after the first fruits were waved as the first fruit of the resurrection from the dead. I have also been taught that when Jesus arose from the dead, he brought the souls from Abraham's bosom with him, and these were also first fruits. They were the souls that had died under the covenants. They had all the prior covenants. These people were first fruits, and so Jesus took them, he took them up to heaven when he arose from the dead. After his presentation to the Father, he came and imparted to his disciples the spirit of truth, which he had promised them to make them one in him, one body of believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and that's John 20, 19 through 22. So this is absolutely fantastic when you really stop and study it. When you look at the Jewish tradition, you look at the Jewish law, you look at the Torah, and you read it, and maybe someday we can halfway, I don't know about me, but we maybe could comprehend it a little bit. 
And this lesson really spoke to me. Whatever lesson I teach, somehow, I don't understand why he does it, but God helps me to learn more. And it's absolutely mind-boggling. I don't understand how the priest didn't see it. I don't understand. Maybe they didn't see it when he was living, but after he died and you saw all of these all of these parallels, it just, it just, anyway, it's wonderful. And I just thank God that we have the message. I thank the good, good Lord that we have the Bible and that we have the knowledge, we have the capability that we do. All right, as a Passover, look forward to Christ's redemptive death and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look forward to our sanctification that proceeds from our burial with him. So the, first, the Feast of first fruits. look forward to Christ's resurrection and our new life with him. Indeed, Christ's resurrection occurred on the same day as the Feast of first fruits, the third day of the Passover. All right, as Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of those who sleep. All right, just as the Feast of first fruits marked the expectation for further harvest, so Christ's resurrection marks the certainty that we too will rise from the dead on that last day. We are going to rise again. And let me tell you, when we do, there's going to be some stuff going on down here. Okay. The feast of first fruits also pointed to the new quality of life that we now have in Christ. As we abide in Christ, we participate in his resurrection. Because he arose from the dead, we are able to consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we don't sin, because we do. I mean, I'm embarrassed to stand up here and teach this lesson. But anyway, at first glance, we might be surprised at Peter's that his, he exhibited such boldness as we see in today's text. After all, he had denied Jesus three times before the crucifixion. He had cowered behind a locked room. But having been reinstated by Jesus himself after the resurrection and receiving the Holy Spirit, Peter became a different man. He was changed. That Holy Spirit changed him. And that Holy Spirit can change us too. All right, verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. That's what Peter wanted everybody to know. He wanted to wake those Jewish people up. Come on, folks. Jesus has risen from the dead. We saw him. We saw him. We heard him. We were witnesses. We need to get excited. We need to get excited because Jesus has risen from the dead. The Jewish people, unfortunately, they were expecting a king like David. They wanted to be free of Roman rule. And I don't blame them. Nobody likes to be, uh, you know, conquered, but whatever. They did not want this Jesus. This Jesus was a humble servant. They didn't want him. <clears throat> Excuse me. The people might not have recognized the arrival of the Messiah, but that was also in God's plan. It was in his plan from the beginning. The death of Christ was no accident or unforeseen wrinkle. It was a perfectly executed plan from God. From the Garden of Eden in which God promised to strike the serpent to the promise of Abraham wherein his seed would be a blessing to all nations, God worked his plan. Now, I don't claim to understand God's plan. I mean, when I think about my poor little nephew, Dinky, when I think about my husband, I think about my son, I think about the loved ones that I've lost, I don't understand God's plan, and I have to be honest with you truthfully, I don't always like God's plan, but God is smarter than I am, and I have to keep trying to tell myself that. God knows better. He knows best. The plan included raising Jesus from the dead, just as the scriptures had predicted. The apostles were witnesses. They had seen Jesus alive and had watched him ascend to heaven to sit on God's right hand. Verse 33a exalted to the right hand of God. To be at the right hand of someone is to be in a position of honor or preeminence. And that's Genesis 48, 13 through 20. Verse 33b, 
He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Or these people saw the cloven tongues. These people heard the rushing wind, and they knew that something awesome had happened. Just before returning to heaven, Jesus reminded the disciples of his Father's plan to send them the promised Holy Spirit. God began to fulfill this promise as he poured out his Spirit in Acts 2, 1 through 4. The phrase that you now see and hear points back to the evidence of the audible and visible um, phenomena of Acts 2, 2 through 4. All right, Peter quoted that prophet has pronounced one of the greatest of all prophecies of Christ's church, and that was Joel in 2, 28 through 32. Joel foresaw Judah devastated by a terrifying locust plague, yet God promised to remove the plague and pour out his blessings if the people repented. Now, I don't know, and I hadn't really, you know, but we have a plague in America, I think. I think that COVID is a plague. And so we really need to pray against it. And looking into the distant future, Joel also said that God planned to do more than restore crops. He also promised to pour out his spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, his message is often called the first complete gospel message because it was the first public announcement of the significance of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The scriptures had predicted that all of this would happen to the Messiah. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I mean, really and truly, they realized, oh my word, we have sacrificed, we have killed the Messiah. What in the world are we going to do? This gospel message penetrated like a sword, Hebrews 4.12, as the people were called to account. Many came to the painful realization that God sent Jesus out of love for them, but they had rejected him. Even though they had not personally driven the nails into his hands and feet, they either agreed with those that did or they approved of the crucifixion by their silence. Though we probably think of the reaction as being cut to the heart as a little more than a gut feeling, certainly many in the crowd had their hearts prepared to receive correction from the Lord. A heart that is willing to ask, what shall we do is prepared to discuss the rich blessings of God. In this case, the people were asking the apostles for real help with their realized need. They realized, oh my word, we need, we need help here, folks. Verse 38a, Peter replied, repent. The words repent and repentance occur more than 50 times in the New Testament. To repent is to turn away from sin and to turn towards God. Verse 38b, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul later explained that to be baptized was to be buried with Christ Jesus into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too will be raised from the dead and we will have a new life while we're still in the body. He further noted that all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And that's why we're called Christians. There is nothing magical about the waters of baptism. Baptism is God's chosen method to help us realize that it is only by God's mercy that he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. As such, baptism is not a human work or merit. Rather, it is the work of God. Verse 38, excuse me, C, for the forgiveness of your sin. The most important thing anyone can do when reaching the age of accountability is to acknowledge that they have, are a sinner and they need to be saved by the grace of God. They need to ask God to forgive them. The wonderful thing is that God is willing to forgive us and to help us resist from sin. I mean, I don't know about you, but I pray sometimes and I ask God, God, I'm not strong enough to do it. I can't do it, Lord. I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I can't. And so what does he do? Somehow he gives me the strength to do it. He does it for me. And I'm not kidding you, he does. Anyway, when we, have, when we are accepting Jesus, when we accept Jesus, 
we have justification. But I told y'all the last time I talked, it's just as if I had never sinned. It happens through Christ. Also, we have sanctification. Sanctification means we are set apart. We are now holy vessels for God to use as he sees fit. Verse 38D, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. With the gift of the Holy Spirit, Christians have the power to put off the works of the flesh and to bear the fruit of the Spirit. In this regard, Peter's sermon foreshadows the church's submission to the leading of the Spirit in the book of Acts and beyond. Verse 39, the promises for you and your children and all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call, and he's calling us even today. Those who heard this sermon understood all of the far-off Jews all around the Mediterranean because that was where most of them had, you know, you migrate around the water. So some of them had left Israel in what is called the diaspora or the dispersion of the Jews beyond Israel. That dispersion was not limited to the exiles in 2 Kings 17.6. They had migrated all through the area. The reality of the diaspora is a context of the first century A.D. with Jews living all over the Roman Empire. All right, <clears throat> verse 40. With many other works he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now he called it a corrupt generation because of the priests, because the priests were not helping the people. They were not doing what they should have been doing. They were not leading the people they were not um, guiding them correctly. And when the Messiah showed up, what did they do? They crucified him. The word translated corrupt is also crooked in Luke 3, 5. The idea in Deuteronomy 32, 5, which refers to a warped and crooked generation. Christians must shine like stars in a sin-darkened world and keep themselves from being polluted by the world. And that probably right there is one of my worst sins, but anyway. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were added to their number that day. Modern estimates suggest that Jerusalem's population normally was somewhere between 60 and 80,000. With the annual observance of Pentecost, however, the number would have been temporarily much higher. The 3,000 who accepted Jesus, uh, Christ that day, therefore would have been just a small number of the people that were there. 42a, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. These decisions changed lives and eternal destiny. The new Christians devoted themselves to the things that they had not done before. They were completely changed. They made a 360-degree turn. But for one thing, or for one thing, they heeded the apostles' teaching. Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth, and that's John 16, 13. They passed these truths along as they teached about Jesus. The life-changing message preserved in the pages of the New Testament remains the very center of the Christian faith. And true teaching is critical today if the message of Christ's saving grace is to go on down through the ages until he comes again. And the Bible is written so that every generation believes that he is at the door. Jesus is coming right now. He's going to be here in 15 minutes. He is ready to come any minute. And that is how it's supposed to be. The Bible is written so that when you read it, you see the end. You see that this is really end time. Look at all these prophecies that have been fulfilled. And so that's how it's supposed to be. God wants us on our toes. He wants us looking. 42B, and to fellowship. And we are supposed to love one another. We're supposed to care for one another. We're supposed to be there for one another. Steadfastness and fellowship is still a model for today's Christian. We have the privilege of belonging to the greatest family on earth as we work together to spread the good news. All right. 42C, the breaking of bread. Breaking of bread will refer either to an ordinary meal or to the Lord's Supper. It doesn't matter either way. Just which is in view here is a matter of some debate. At the very least, we should think that these meals involve close fellowship since that was what was noted earlier on in the scripture. Verse 42D, and to prayer. 
Although prayer is mentioned fourth, that doesn't mean it's of lesser importance, whether prayer was offered by an individual or by a group. These earliest believers realized how important prayer was to their new relationship with God, and so it is today. And so we as Christians pray. 43a, everyone was filled with awe. And upon hearing all of this, all of these people got excited and they thought, wow, oh, this is just too cool. Oh, this is just absolutely wonderful. They were excited. They seemed to be filled with this greatest excitement. And when the crowd realized that they had rejected and killed the Messiah, they must have been filled with fear. And then the respect, reverence, and absolute awe that Jesus would do this for them. 43b, the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. God continued to shake Jerusalem by empowering the apostles to do miracles, which is what wonders and signs are. The miracles were wonders because those who witnessed them were amazed. They were signs and they pointed people to the truth about Jesus. 44 and 45. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. One of the most important characteristics of Christian is generosity. The fact that these earlier Christians had everything in common indicates that they shared their possessions, going so far as to sell property and give to anyone who had need. There would have been a pressing need during this time also because of those who had stayed in Jerusalem for the Pentecost now became Christians and so they wanted to be together with other Christians and they didn't really want to go back home to where they didn't have any other Christians to uh, be with. So they really wanted to stay here with these people. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And this is just more information about how excited they were, how much they wanted to be together with other Christians. And that's one of the things that we need to be is we need to fellowship with other Christians. So that helps to strengthen us. All right. Verse 47. Praising God and, employing the fa and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so these apostles, they managed to put out the word and the people were saved. 3,000 on that first day and then more and more and more were added to the church. The most powerful realization from today's text is that Christ is still good news for a dying world. He has been since the day of Pentecost and he will continue to be so until he returns. Until then we must share Jesus with everyone we can. Foundational to this effort is a sense of awe which is often missing in today's church. Sometimes our worship services feel stale. Our people come into church, and I know I've done it too, and I really am sorry, I apologize, but drift off. I mean, really and truly. It's partly, I think, because back in the day when I was working, I didn't really get enough rest, but that's beside the point. We need to be, we need to be alert. We need to be oriented. We need to be on task. Sometimes our prior lives... We just kind of dry up. We don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to pray sometimes. We allow the urgent or the right now to distract us from the important things. But in those times, we can ask for transformation as we cry to God to restore to me the joy of your salvation. God still works in and through his people. May we be aware of his movement in our lives, our churches, and our communities so that we too may see the church grow daily. Now, I have a little something I want to share with you all, if you don't mind. Whoops. Okay, this is a vessel. This is the believer. This is us, okay? This is God, Jesus. This is God, Jesus. And inside, this water represents the Holy Spirit. 
So when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts and save us from our sins, what does he do? He does it. And he pours within us the Holy Spirit. So each of us who have asked Jesus to save us from our sins, we have received the Holy Spirit. Now, unlike me, there's enough Holy Spirit for everybody. There's enough Holy Spirit for everybody. It doesn't run out. It's, it's never going to run out. So if you haven't accepted Christ, you need to. You need to really think about it. All right. I just want to say that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, and it is our, he is our mighty warrior, our El Gabor. He fights our battles for us. We don't have to fight battles anymore. The Holy Spirit fights those battles for us. All right, I thank you for your attention. I just want to have a little word of prayer before we quit. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to your presence. And oh, Father, oh, Father Jesus, we just thank you. We can't thank you enough, Lord. No thanks is enough. But we just praise your name. We praise your name. Oh, we do. And we thank you, Father. Oh, we thank you. And Jesus, I just want to thank you for this lesson. I thank you for Carter and the Board of Christian Education. I thank you for their dedication to the truth, Father. And I just ask that you would just bless everyone in this building, that you would just bless this church, Father, in a mighty way. And I would just ask, Lord Jesus, that the people on the prayer list, that you would heal them, meet their needs, whatever they may be. And I ask you too, Father, which I should have done to begin with, to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me, Father, from all unrighteousness. And I ask this, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I ask you too, Father, to be with Sam as he brings our message today. Touch him and give him whatever it is that you want him to present. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. Thank